fact, I'm mostly just plotting those two functions, IL and VL, that we just solved for, and then just uh, uh, discussing what that means. That's the interpretation. Okay. So the lecture is called Transient and Steady State Response, and it's trying to uh, differentiate between these two uh, regions or, or, or intervals in our response. Uh, so um, you can find this, the source for this, it's in a, uh, a notebook, a Jupyter notebook on the website. Um, so you can download it and um, I would encourage you to do it. Uh, it's like, so it uses Python, um, Jupyter Notebooks and Sage Math, so it's a, it's a lot like MATLAB um, and kind of Mathematica and kind of like a mixture of things all in one. Um, and coding, right? It's so much fun. I really recommend it. I really feel that to be a uh, uh, how do I want to put it? To be a high performing technically oriented engineer in today's environment, you have to be able to program and use some of these computing tools. So that, I mean, I think that there are engineering jobs out there where you don't have to, this is true. Um, but if you wanna be technically oriented and be really pushing the envelope as an engineer, then this is, this is really, you know, you gotta buy into the, the programming thing. I remember I was very resistant. When I was an undergrad, it was still like, well, not everybody has to know how to code, but I feel like now it's like getting to that point. So, yeah. Can you give some examples of like what you would use it for? Oh yeah, totally. So, oh yeah, I don't want to get too far off track. But yes, so whenever you do an analysis of some situation, like say you're, you're like, okay, I want to figure out uh, if this part, if the stress on this part is going to be too much stress. So you do a you know, simulation of it and you say, okay, the max force is going to be this given, uh, you know, maybe like the most extreme dynamic situation it could be in. Um, and so given that max force, I want to see what the um, factor of safety would be for designing it with this dimension on this part, on this side, and like this other dimension on this other side, and see a graph of like what the factor of safety would be. And so you say, well, you know, I, I, you know, I this space-wise, this dimension, like I, I need a lot of space in this dimension, so I'd like to make it as thin as possible. The other side, I don't mind as much, but I see where the cost trade-offs are, and I'm gonna choose these dimensions. Um, that kind of analysis, like, is essentially impossible without a, a computer now. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not impossible. Like, it, old school uh, engineers could have done it, but it would have taken months of analysis to do. Nowadays, we should be able to do an analysis like that in you know, maybe like a week or two. Um, so it's not so much that we can do, some things you just can't do without a computer. But a lot of times it's just that you can do it so much faster with a computer. Um, no more sure. And yeah, and you can see, and you can visualize things so much better too. Like, what is what 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 really happens when I change this dimension? What what's the result in some result that I that I care about? So, yeah, uh, I think it's really key. Um, but I will say I will say that there are there are some fields where um, the engineers still don't use it very much, um, and. I think those are those are fields that are somebody soon is going to start applying it in those fields, and then everybody's going to have to to compete. <laughs> and so those are good opportunities for people, young engineers. I think you make yourself really valuable when you come into a, a situation where people aren't doing this, and then you have the skills to do that, they, and they don't. So they want you know they want that. That's like oh you. You know, you don't have the experience. That doesn't make you an asset to them yet. But um, you have the, the tool set that they don't have. So I think it's a great, um, it's a great skill. Um, okay. So now I have about the same amount of demos I had this morning to do this part. So <laughs> uh, good.
So let's consider the circuit um, uh, from this last example that we just did. Uh, we found that the inductor had uh, current and voltage responses like this. And I, uh, I'm going to call out the, the two different lines here, but they're the same. This is the IL equation. I plugged in the numbers uh, for C and for K1 and et cetera. Uh, so note that the top uh, of each of these equations, the top line of each of these equations, decays exponentially to zero. So this is the, the decaying exponential term. This was our kappa, right? Um, and this was our kappa again. So these decaying exponential terms, they go to zero as time increases. So the response while this exponentially decaying term dominates is called the transient response. And the response thereafter is the steady state response. So the transient response is not just this top line because while this top line is happening, there's also this second line that's happening. But after a while, this top line becomes irrelevant, becomes so small that it's not important. So then the second, the second line will dominate. And uh, in six time constants, the exponential term has decayed to less than 1%. Okay? So uh, assuming that you don't have some really small steady state response, by six time constants at 1% of what the initial value was, um, uh, is usually small enough to assume that, that the other term is going to be dominating um, after six time constants. Five, six time constants, you're within, I think that e to the negative six is like 0 0.002. So unless your amplitude of oscillation here is really tiny, at that point you should be totally dominating. It, the the sinus wedge should be totally dominating. Okay, uh, good. So we will plot the current and voltage from above uh, from those two equations to illustrate the transient and steady state response. So plots cannot be created without some definitions of parameters. So I'm defining the resistance, the inductance, the current, the initial current through the um, inductor the amplitude of the current source, A, omega, the frequency of the current source, um, and tau we solved for was L over R. And then this is just defining the equations in this Python language, right? It's actually Sage Math module. Um, and I did this little thing just so that you could see, like, so what type of object are these. So in Python, I'm trying to like input these little like tidbits to help us learn a little bit. In Python, one can query an object with the function type as follows. So type of IL gives, it returns this object. It says, oh, it's a symbolic expression. And that's the, you know, the type of thing that's useful when you're programming. You're like, oh, OK, I got this object. What is it? It's a symbolic expression. Um, you can do certain things with symbolic expressions that you can't do with other things, and you can do other things with other types of objects. So we now turn to defining simulation parameters. So uh, simulation is, is actually a little too loose of a term here. I would say more like the, the numerical parameters, the, the plot parameters. We want 201 points on the plot. I picked that because usually it gives a nice smooth plot, that many points on the graph. Um, you can play with that though. Uh, minimum time, I'm going to say zero. I'm going to go up to eight time constants because I figure uh, that'll show me a little bit of the steady state, but not too much of the steady state. Um, then I'm going to make my time array uh, linearly spaced from t min to t max, and I want 201 points and 201. Now to create the numerical arrays to plot, I am initializing these arrays, and I'm just doing a for loop. And I'm just evaluating those functions at each time and sticking them in arrays. This is probably you know, a little bit too procedurally written, but I do it this way. It's probably a little less efficient than another way to do it. But I do it this way because it helps us to initially understand to use simpler uh, structures, like a for loop. OK. Uh, and then the, the last thing is to plot, which Actually, 
really just this gets us the plot, um, the time vector or the time array, and then the values of the function arrays that we plot, that we computed up there, and then the rest of this is actually just formatting, um, which is almost always like for me like two thirds of the of the work is the formatting part. But if you didn't, if you were just doing this for yourself and you weren't like presenting it um, like I'm doing. Uh, then you wouldn't have to, to go through quite as much of this. So the figure shows that in around six time constants, as is typical, the response settles in to steady oscillations. And so that's what this pretty, pretty figure shows. So the current as a function of time, we, we said the initial, so I0 is that initial constant. We set that to 10. So Good thing it shows up that way on our graph, otherwise we would have had a mistake somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the current, it decays and oscillates. Mm -hmm. So that's, we're seeing both that exponentially decaying term and that sinusoidal term um, at the same time during the transient. So this gray area is sort of the transient. And then it sort of settles into a steady state where it's staying at a certain amplitude and, uh, and phase, so it just settles into an oscillation. Similarly, the voltage starts out at a value, it decays to its steady state as well. And notice that, I mean, this transition isn't like super well defined. Somewhere between five and six time constants, it's like pretty much you're there usually, but it's, it's uh, something that is more of an, uh, a concept of like, Definitely over here is transient. Definitely over here is steady state. Where the boundary is is not well defined, but um, the, the concepts are still useful. Okay, so uh, note that the steady state is not necessarily static, but can be oscillatory as in this case. In fact, every linear dynamic system driven by a sinusoid we'll have a sinusoidal steady state response as we will explore further in co the coming lectures. Um, often the term AC circuit analysis is used to refer to circuits with sinusoidal sources in steady state. So when people say AC circuit analysis, a lot of times they mean sinusoidal source, yeah, but not just that, but in steady state. In many circuits, steady state is achieved relatively quickly, which is why this is the most popular type of analysis. So in electronics, these time constants tend to be like microseconds, milliseconds, and so a lot of times you only care about the steady state. Um, but not always. Like, for instance, when you're charging a capacitor, you definitely don't care just about the steady state because that's not, it doesn't tell you things like how long it took <laughs> to get there. Um, so we don't always just care about steady state, but it is in electronics usually the most interesting thing. Um, so our approach has yielded both responses together. In order to consider the steady state only, all we must do is ignore the exponentially decaying terms. Just like set that term to zero, and that's the, the steady state. Uh, which are the initial conditions contribution to the transient response. However, there are easier methods of obtaining the steady state response if the transient response isn't of interest. The next chapter considers these. So we're gonna, in the next chapter, we're gonna say, oh, okay, if we only care about this region, the steady state region, there's, a, there's an easier way than going through the differential equation that we did. It's in fact very similar, the, the analysis that we'll do, but we won't have to solve any differential equations. And I know some of you are rejoicing right now, but don't worry, there'll be more differential equations for you. Um, you'll be very practiced up soon. All right, have a good weekend. <laughs>